Hello, hello everyone. Welcome. This is part two of our panel that we've titled uh, Humanity, Ecology and Trauma. We have another four excellent panelists, speakers. Uh, three of them are here now. The fourth uh, we're trying to, to connect and this is, this is just the reality of living in, 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 in Zoom world, right? That uh, uh, we have to be adaptive to uh, 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 unexpected occurrences like this. But we have three speakers already ready to go. Uh, let me introduce uh, int introduce them to you before they go on. Uh, the first speaker that we have is Marina Grzinic, and she is a professor and a research advisor at the Institute of Philosophy at the Scientific and Research Center of the Slovenian Academy of Science and Arts. Uh, she's also a professor at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna uh, in Austria, and she's a well-known uh, philosopher and theoretician, public intellectual. Uh, the second, hello, <laughs> welcome Marina. Uh, the second speaker who I hope will join us is uh, uh, eventually is Kent Zoma Edstrom, and he works on a historical uh, areas of research, including the Cold War, naturally, uh, the Second Indochina War, uh, uh, literature, books, movies, and pop culture from 1945 to 2000. And he has particular interests in the historical value of war movies and how war movies can function as commemorative pieces of pop culture. Uh, the third speaker is Giacomo Bagarella, who is currently a consultant, a consultant and a writer based in New York. Uh, he advises clients on urban and economic development. Uh, he's published in places like Foreign Policy, and I'm very proud to say he was once, I'm, I don't know if he is proud to, to, to say this, but he was once a student of mine when I was teaching at the Lee Kuan Yew uh, School of uh, Public Policy, where he was a master's uh, student. Um, the fourth speaker is Marina Canetti, who is, I'm also very proud to say, a former colleague of mine uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, where she is now an assistant uh, professor. She works on several very interesting issues uh, uh, surrounding such things as global governance and the visual politics of climate change, uh, migration, and the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So these are our terrific uh, speakers that we can look forward to. Before I get uh, Marina uh, to begin, I would like to invite uh, the audience to uh, think about the questions that they might want to ask. And don't wait till the last minute because the problem always is we run out of time uh, very quickly. So uh, the moment you have a question that you'd like to ask, just type your question into the uh, Q&A box and we'll try our very best to get to these questions. Uh, also, I will like to invite the panelists to uh, also think of questions that, that they might want to pose to uh, one another uh, after the presentation. So let, let's, let's begin um, uh, with Marina. Take it away. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, I will actually start with my share screen. Oh, hi. we are here, I think. It's uh, everything clear? You see me? Yes? My share screen? Yeah. Great. Uh, so um, the title uh, that uh, I have of my paper is Trauma, uh, Cold War, Decolonization and China. Uh, I would like to address uh, uh, the issue of decolonization and, uh, co and the Cold War. It's a decision based on three points. The first point is uh, uh, why? Uh, it is because decolonization that is in direct relations to Cold War is not on the agenda of the conference. And most importantly, where was China at the time of the Bandung Conference in 1955, uh, that is the precursor of the non-aligned movement established in 1961 in Belgrade. So this is my first question. 
former Yugoslavia it was the place of uh, this uh, non-aligned movement uh, in Belgrade in 1961. This lack is maybe a scholars expose because China was a never a formal colony, though China was at the site of imperial competition. That means relationship between China and Britain in this relation is a complex that it needs to be included in the story. Second, um, what is my place here, I have to ask. After 9-11-2001, the terrorist attack in the heart of the US, the changes that came violently open up a discourse of decoloniality. What is decoloniality? It's coming after post-colonialism. Decoloniality is not passing over colonialism, but in 2000 exposes the colonial matrix of power that supports neoliberal global capitalism. It is related also to the demand of the time to decolonize the world practically on every corner of the world that has received its strength with hashtag Black Lives Matter movement. Third, I am a child of the Cold War, born in 1958 in Europe in former Yugoslavia, which disintegrated in 1991 at the end of the Cold War. And it's the site of one of many genocides that occurred after 1945. Uh, which is actually the Srebrenica genocide in 1995 in Bosnia and Herzegovina that was part of former Yugoslavia. This is paradoxical because Yugoslavia, as I said, was before the promoter of the non-aligned movement or NAM, which dates back to the 1955 Bandung conference in Indonesia. All this produced questions where decolonization in the discussion of Southeast Asia and the Cold War is. So I have a primary source. My primary source is Kerry Fraser. And in his text, he talks about this decolonization and the Cold War. Uh, that, uh, it's uh, the text that was published in a book from 2013 uh, that was edited by Richard Immerman and Petra Gerde. Uh, and I think this text uh, makes uh, remarkable points that I would like to highlight as to point to the importance of decolonization when we talk about the Cold War. Uh, so this text, in difference to numerous analysis, um, emphasize two points that are directly connected to decolonization as anti-colonial movement fight against white supremacy, this is first, because of, uh, uh, this is what uh, uh, Fraser actually very much uh, highlights. And the second is uh, he uh, exposes the second point, and uh, this is the, the time of decolonization, we have a formation of new states in the part of uh, Southeast uh, uh, Asia. If for the regime of white supremacy, racism, Racism as such is key for the new state, all is organized around citizenship. So these two points are key for me. Uh, both are key points for the time we live in. A again, hashtag Black Lives Matter and citizenship as such. Um, because citizenship at that point meant the protection, protect rights, and today, being without a citizenship means being left outside of any structure of the, uh, by the state or the city, while being heavily violated as refugees, for example. Uh, so uh, these questions uh, relate uh, directly uh, to the question of power structures that are connected with this question. Um, so maybe the blind spots of leaving out the topics of decolonization as a topic in the conference are related to the present moment of neoliberal global capitalism that I also name as necrocapitalism, provoking traumas because of many reasons. Some can be like fault domestic politics and new forms of strong power relationship. So let's us begin. I have some points and I go, I rush through these points uh, that, that are, uh, uh, that are 
uh, that the Cold War was the period that immediately followed World War II. The post-1945 period is marked by atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima Marina? and Nagasaki. Yes. So, sorry, I just, just to interrupt you, I, I wonder if you intend for us to see any uh, PowerPoint slides. Have you been, because we are only seeing the first uh, uh, slide, I, um, perhaps. Uh, how, how, how the first slide? I, uh, you don't see my, my, no. my slide? We okay. only see we only see one slide. Okay, uh, let me uh, let me see once again. Uh, uh, you you. Uh, yeah, we don't we, we can only see your title slide. But you see now. You see I, we only now. see the title slide, just the first slide with your name, with the title and your name. Oh, can you can you click the enable editing? There's a. What we can see also at the top is something that says uh, enable, what was it? Enable editing, is it? Yeah. Enable editing. But, Do you uh, see this now? Do you see this? Uh, we see only you. Oh, crazy. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, um, I, I, I think, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little perplexed because... Yes, yes. Okay, uh, let me see. Um, so share screen, maybe uh, share screen. Kivita. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, oh my God. Um, <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay. So I I go just a moment. Do you see now? Are you seeing anything now? Yes, we are, yes, definitely. We are now on your sixth slide, slide six. Okay, so it's uh, it's this. Do you see this? Perfect. Perfectly. Okay, so Perfectly. I thought uh, I come to the point. I, I I apologize. It's too early, but it's not early. It's just uh, some technical stuff. So what my point is until now, I put very clearly, and I will go very fast because of the time. That uh, why I want to talk about decolonization that is not part of the structure of the conference. Secondly, I put my source that is a really important. Carrie Fraser, decolonization and the Cold War from. 2013, and I uh, expose two points. One is that decolonization leads us to white supremacy and racism, and the second is it leads us to uh, actually the question of uh, citizenship and the formation of new states. That was part of this process of decolonization in the time of the Cold War, and also connects us to the non-alignment uh, uh, movement, NAM. So what are the points of elaboration? Why to come and talk about these things? First, I said that the post-1945 period is marked by the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima Shima and Nagasaki. Uh, this is important because uh, we see uh, that uh, um, what happened in that uh, moment is also possible to put in parallel with the genocidal tragedies unleashed by Nazi Germany in Europe, shattered the, that shattered the notion, notion of Western imperial dominance. Uh, and this is uh, an important point. The West was seen or the Occident in different ways. In 1945, uh, we have uh, uh, two poles, the Soviet Union and US. In 1949, the People's Republic of China enters the history. The number three, the struggle for Asian independence would actually facilitate the expansion of the Cold War in Asia. This is a quite an important point. The Cold War actually came because of the question of Asian independence and the formation of new states. Uh, the creation of the People's Republic of China, extending the communist influence into the heart of Asia and presented America with a new challenge. America, I mean US as such, because it's two Americas and, uh, and not only one America. Number five, 
the competition between the members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, that means NATO, and on the other side, the Warsaw Pact and their allies influenced the processes and outcomes of the decolonization process. This I make a direct reference to Fraser from 2013. Uh, then uh, number six, uh, the lack of thinking that period of decolonization is because of southeastern postcolonial nationalism that would be in that interpretation a shaper of the cold era was seen as something negative. So um, uh, uh, this was a kind of a point that uh, um, uh, was presented in many other, in difference to Fraser, many other interpretation. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, they and Liam in 2010, they said that because of this, the uh, Cold War uh, can be uh, seen as a cultural and ideological conflict. I think this is actually wrong because the way how to treat uh, uh, also the independence movements in Southeast China uh, is actually a kind of, uh, um, again, ideologically posit and it's actually posit from the point of view of the Occident. Uh, in number seven, the Nazi regime in Europe in 1945 demonstrated the ultimate logic of the politics of West and civilization and the ideology of racial supremacy through genocide of the Jewish people. This is one of the key, key points to understand Europe uh, in their misery and also the Occident is losing a, po a power of this uh, civilization mission. Number eight, the genocide uh, that uh, uh, happened before, why actually we had the genocide of the Jews is connected with the positions of Nazi Germany and preci precisely with the campaign and the ethnic extermination and collective punishment that the German Reich uh, put on the Herero, Nama and San people uh, in uh, Southwest Africa and uh, now it's Namibia. It was the first genocide of the 20th century and took place between 19, uh, 1904 and 1908. I made again a reference to Fraser. So this is showing actually this continuity of this genocidal politics. And if I come uh, toward the end, uh, by the time of the uh, World War II, racial superiority was increasingly relegated to the margins of serious political debate. While this uh, racial superiority was central, as we saw from a different genocide that was already in the way in the 20th century. Then the defense of Hong Kong does become an important link in the common front against communism in Asia. And this is the role of Great Britain. 11, decolonization was more than a process of political transformation of countries and peoples. It was also a symbol of moral renewal leading to the birth and the revival of nations. Fraser again in 2013. At the time, in this time, it was many new organization that was formed, like uh, the idea was to go out of this bipolarity, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. So we have United Nations, but also the non-aligned movement that was very important in various aspects in decolonization. In response to the expansion of the Cold War into Asia, the newly independent countries of the region actually sponsored the Bandung conference in Indonesia in 1955, which aimed to build support for Asian nationalism in a certain way, nation state, and to create a space for a negotiated end to a colonial rule. Uh, very important is uh, that uh, these relations to decolonization, because we found this directly in what is actually going on now in this present moment. And the very um, uh, uh, important text is the one written by uh, Fanon. Um, that in 1952 uh, uh, say uh, uh, an important reflection when, while uh, writing on Algeria, an important reflections regarding Indochina 
and uh, what was going there. The point of Fanon is, and uh, um, you can read on my uh, slide, uh, he is actually saying that uh, uh, in uh, Indochina uh, was uh, uh, the revolt there uh, was uh, uh, in a certain way important and critical because of the colonial power, but also because uh, I make the reference to the last uh, uh, sentence, it, it is because quite simply, it was in more than one way becoming impossible to the uh, figures, the people there and uh, in Indochina uh, to breath. And this question of the impossibility to actually take care to, uh, to, uh, to uh, in, in symbolic I will, I, uh, it's possible today to connect directly uh, to the question of the movement hashtag Black Lives Matter. Uh, so uh, what are the, the slogan is I cannot bread uh, by uh, Floyd uh, that uh, be, be in uh, start to be uh, a, a, re, a cry for racial justice and police reform in the United States and around the world. So uh, these uh, connections is possible to be established. But uh, as I said, uh, the colonization uh, actually opened, and this is my final point, and I conclude with this, the decolonization opens not only racial supremacy, um, uh, these uh, uh, rash proce processes of racializations, uh, the power the power of the Occident being uh, in a civilization mission that fall down with the genocide in um, in uh, the genocide in the Second World War before already in Africa where the genocide the Holocaust of the Jews and actually go on with genocidal policy in the Second World War in uh, uh, China, if we think about Japan and so on, but also decolonization uh, is rising an important, was rising an important question. And this was about human equality and citizenship uh, within imperial states. So here you see um, uh, uh, what uh, uh, it's uh, uh, quite an impressive thing. It's a satellite images of Uyghurs detention camps uh, spreading in China uh, in different, uh, different uh, levels, 2015, 2018, 2020. And what this means that uh, uh, practically China is uh, accused of committing crimes against humanity and possibly genocide against the Uyghur population and other Muslim majority ethnic groups in the Northwest region of Tianjin. Uh, so my point is that if we don't uh, learn from these processes of decolonization that I put out, don't understand that what was going on was not just a, a violent, uh, as it's saying, a pure brutal nationalism, but was a demand to actually uh, come from this uh, subordination to a position of decision as uh, being out of this racial power and suprematist view, but also to understand the importance of citizenship and understand the importance of the new nation states, uh, how to deal uh, with uh, um, citizenship and human rights in their new, uh, newly founded states. So the same problem we have also in Yugoslavia with the Srebrenica genocide. And because of this, it's necessary to connect uh, Cold War and decolonizations, or even more, a Cold War cannot be seen outside of the view of decolonization. And if we don't, we do this, uh, and we don't make this connection, then we find ourselves precisely with my last slide, and precisely with new, uh, very traumatic uh, uh, sequences, uh, also uh, really deeply violent that we have in the present moment in the world. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, this uh, will be uh, my uh, presentation. Of so many dots across time and space. I mean, the, 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 the picture that you produce is, is startling right, from, from that effort. So thank you. That's, a, I think, a, a terrific way to start. And it's one that you know, takes a kind of bird's eye view to see all these patterns. Uh, the, the, the next paper uh, or the next speaker 
uh, Giacomo, I, th I think you will take the opposite approach, right, which is to kind of speak from your experiences of seeing and, and hearing and feeling on the ground. So uh, uh, over to you, Giacomo. Um, thank you, and, and sorry if there is some uh, background noise, but uh, I will be sharing my screen and hopefully will be um, loud enough that you can hear. So let me share my screen just now. All right. Um, well, uh, good morning to everybody in um, Hong Kong. Um, Happily for the conference, I am joining um, from Thursday night in New York City, so it's still in the past here, um, and you can tell me what the, the future looks like from, from where you are. Um, but um, in, in this presentation, I will offer three frames to view memory and discuss museums and memorials in four Asian nations of Taiwan, Vietnam, South Korea, and Cambodia. And uh, I will conclude with four reflections on the nature of memory. And these um, perspectives are mostly informed by uh, my own personal travels in, in these four countries. Well, as uh, Kenneth mentioned at the beginning, I was a student at the Lee Kuan Yew School in Singapore. And I hope that after this presentation, you won't uh, regret having me there. So to begin with, um, I want to offer three frames to observe museums and memorials. And um, really, I, I, I traveled to um, these sites in these countries, seeking to learn about how um, you know, different peoples and countries represent their historical uh, memories, both the, the positive sides and the less positive sides. First, and this is a frame that is um, developed by Viet Thanh Nguyen in his book, Nothing Ever Dies we can see these sites as industries of memory, which are local destinations uh, for, for residents of the countries where they exist, but also exist as places on the tourist itinerary in our key way that especially foreigners experience and learn about the history of these countries. Second, uh, we have the notion that uh, these, these sites convey different narrative stances that range from the more scholarly, the personal, and what we can call either official or depending on, on your position, your interpretation, it could be called propaganda. And third and final, there, um, there's a dichotomy, in the, this dichotomy between secular and religious memory comes from Ian Buruma's The Wages of Guilt, that narratives can either appear religious, thereby facilitating collective remembrance or secular, facilitating analysis and understanding. But um, I suggest that there, there's more and that there are um, sites and, and memorials that can also be seen as experiential. So facilitating interaction with um, the memory by touching, feeling, purchasing and, and performing other types of actions. The sites that I will talk about um, are, there's four and um, range from Northeast to Southeast Asia. And each makes really clear that the so-called Cold War was actually quite hot in this part of the world. These conflicts caused millions of civilian and military casualties and wounded, displaced, and traumatized many, many more. Um, and in some ways, they demonstrate that the Cold War persists, such as in the separation uh, between North and South Korea, the uh, cross-strait relations between China and Taiwan, and the ongoing uh, military uh, tribunals for um, crimes against humanity in Cambodia as well. I chose these sites specifically, not because they're the only ones or necessarily the most important ones, because I had the opportunity to visit them firsthand between 2015 and 2016 and found them meaningful and evocative and, and worth discussing. Um, and this is not to belittle any other sites um, in these countries or other countries that also have their own story to tell. Before I get into the discussion of these sites, however, I want to pause to add some three caveats that um, really have to do with seeking memory with humility. First is the fact of subjectivity and visiting any museum or memorial is a subjective experience that is formed by uh, the viewer's personal experience, upbringing, um, knowledge and perspective. And just as I see these sites in a particular way, any one of you who might have visited them will see them in a different way and will see my reflection of these sites in, in your own perspective. 
The second is comprehensiveness, which obviously in 15 minutes, it's impossible to do justice to the histories of four countries and even these sites themselves. And so I will inevitably leave uh, a lot out. Hopefully we can touch on some of it in the Q&A, but um, there's definitely not the ability to, to consider the full suite. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, these sites represent very tragic examples of conflict and loss. And I don't want to get distracted from um, the, that human suffering. And I want to acknowledge and, and respect that human suffering, uh, even though some sites may uh, you know, prioritize the uh, visual appeal of instruments of war, uh, of you know, tourism paraphernalia, et cetera. And so um, these are just uh, three things that, that I want to note and acknowledge. So to begin with, let's travel to Kinmen Island in, in Taiwan, which is a small island, just 20 kilometers across, um, right across from um, China, Fujian province, and the city of uh, Xiamen, which has about 4.3 million people. Uh, nationalist forces held on to Kinmen at the end of the Chinese Civil War and repelled several attempts at invasion in the late 40s and 1950s. The island then withstood decades of alternate day artillery bombardment by the People's Liberation Army. And today it is actually a tourist destination for visitors from China who can hop across in a, a very quick and easy ferry ride. Kinmen uh, really serves as an open air museum where visitors can encounter both beautiful ancient Fujian style homes with very characteristic and in particular swallowtail roofs, as well as ugly modern concrete bunkers and coastal defenses, such as the ones that you see in the pictures on the left hand side. There are many military history museums that dot the island and while on the outside they adopt uh, traditional architecture, as you can see in the picture in the middle. Um, on the inside, they make use of more, um, you know, quote unquote, modern um, infographics that seem dated today, but, you know, were probably very advanced for the 1980s, 1990s, etc. For example, showing the, the number of artillery shells fired at the island from mainland China throughout the 1950s, 1960s and, and 1970s. And so these uh, sort of displays make the point that um, the island, its inhabitants, the Taiwanese regime uh, really displayed a lot of endurance and bravery. But beyond that, um, I think that the historical experience also extends to commercial tourism. As you see in the picture on the right at the uh, Maestro Wu knife shop, you can purchase a kitchen knife allegedly made from uh, steel from Chinese artillery shells. Um, this is something that uh, some tourist guides say might actually not be the case, that this is more of a, a marketing gimmick but um, really this is the full tourist experience of seeing the outside um, you know, environment of the coastal defenses, visiting the museums, and then being able to bring home a souvenir. And you know, I can say that uh, I definitely purchased one of these myself as well. Um, but ultimately we shouldn't forget that the island is a place where people live and represents both a larger scale tribute to a previous history of cross streets relations and a reminder that the state of Taiwan and Kinmen itself is still contentious. Traveling southeast, we go to the War Remnants Museum and Kuchi Tunnels in and around Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Its museums and displays uh, most clearly uh, signify what Viet Thanh Nguyen um, says when he talks about the fact that country's level of economic development also comes through in the quality of their museums. And this can come through in the type of exhibits, the quality of translation, curation, displays, graphics, and more, and will be um, you know, really uh, clear when comparing the images that you see here with what we will see in the next slide when we talk about South Korea. Inherent in Vietnam's displays are its pride in having defeated the US and its claim to victim status because of American war crimes, such as bombing with napalm, um, toxic chemicals that cause birth defects and cancer, and um, other uh, you know, deeds that American soldiers perform during the war. While the downtown museum though provides an overarching narrative, uh, the rural tunnels in Kuchi uh, were sites where uh, communist fighters hid and ambushed American and South Vietnamese forces, show communists as cunning and Americans as cartoonishly hapless figures. Uh, these are uh, scenes that 
you might see in you know, Tom and Jerry cartoons or the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote with um, the Americans being the cartoon animals that always fall into the canyon or hit their head with their own hammer um, and are really just a parody of themselves. At the same time, these narratives also help to mask anything that the Hanoi regime might have done during the and after the Indochina War to its own population, such, such as by imprisoning um, lots of supporters of the former South Vietnamese regime. Ultimately, the visitor experience goes beyond uh, seeing, and at Kuchi Tunnels, visitors can enter an enlarged tunnel um, made specifically for tourists so they could see what it was like to be underground at the time um, and uh, purchase shells and, and, and bullets to fire with vintage weapons such as famous AK-47 or M16 rifles at the shooting range. So this becomes really an, an amusement ground and provides a truly immersive experience for visitors to the site. Um, we go back northeast to the War Memorial of Korea in Seoul. Uh, when discussing the religious or secular characteristics of museums and memorials, their aesthetic really tells a story. In the case of the enormous War Memorial of Korea, um, I would like to call out some elements of its architecture, such as a large dome, two um, sweeping arms with columns around the central plaza, and an obelisk-like pillar in the middle. Uh, these, to me, really evoke another uh, famous or a famous religious site. I will uh, give you a couple of seconds to think about which that may be, and then we'll uh, make a comparison and, and see if that, uh, that connection appears to you as well. Um, the site that I'm talking about is the uh, Vatican and, and St. Peter's Square in Rome, uh, which similarly has these two um, large embracing arms around the plaza an obelisk in the middle and a large dome overlooking this public space. And um, I'm not sure whether the similarity is, is deliberate or not, but it seems you know, too close to just be coincidental. However, in the case of the War Memorial of Korea, what it has that the Vatican does not is a large B-52 bomber, which you can see in the bottom right corner of the image to really put the fear of God in visitors. The many aircraft, land vehicles, and even boats on display are a recurring feature of military museums and memorials, which juxtapose stories of human suffering with the same industrial tools that caused it. The analogy to the Vatican is also apt because the war memorial serves as a sort of so-called ex voto, which is uh, a ritual in, in Catholic Christianity of um, acknowledging a miracle or a blessing and giving thanks for the miracle or the blessing. South Korea was doubly blessed by United Nations intervention in the Korean War and later by its economic miracle. These two events infused the museum, as you can see in the central and right-hand picture, as the museum pays tribute to the foreigners, most of these individuals are foreigners, who saved South Korea from the North and laid the basis for today's industrialized democratic state. I find it extremely rare for a museum to focus on the heroism and accomplishment of strangers or foreigners, and the war memorial stands out in this regard. Finally, Cambodia. These sites are different as they're less about war in the common sense of uh, military conflict between uh, regular or irregular armies, and instead are about the brutal war of a regime against its own people. This is a regime where neighbors became each other's jailers and denounced each other and each other's families, causing, to, uh, causing deportation uh, investigation, torture, and mass murder. Tuol Sleng is a former high school in urban Phnom Penh, which was a Khmer Rouge prison torture and interrogation center, also known as S21. Classrooms, which you can see from the outside on the left-hand side, where students used to learn became the site of a perverse education where political prisoners arrested and investigated for imaginary crimes were tested day after day and only a false confession could mean that they could pass the exam and move on to the next stage, which was execution. When I visited Bo Meng, uh, the gentleman in the middle, who is only one of a handful of more than 20,000 prisoners who survived, one of a handful who survived um, detention at S21 of 20,000 who were there and nearly all of them were killed, 
uh, was there to answer questions and sign copies of the biography. Despite his role as a living witness, it really felt morbid to talk to him about his experience, something which was no doubt compounded by our language barriers. He was an artist arrested on spurious charges and survived ironically by painting portraits of Pol Pot and other Khmer Rouge leaders on behalf of the regime. His wife was murdered, and, but he survived and eventually testified um, at the tribunal against the camp commandant and guards and has used his art to process his trauma, constructing a Cold War narrative that perpetuates itself. Just as Tuol Sang showed the industrial processing of victims of photos, torture, and death, Chong Ek, which is uh, better known as the killing fields and is a, a rural site, uh, shows the regime brutal agrarian side. It is the site of mass graves, um, where today you can see sort of chickens uh, running around on the ground. And at the same time, that very same ground is continuing to return human bones and fragments of clothes from the people who were murdered there. Yet, rather than show the most famous image of the site, which is a stupa filled with thousands of human skulls, I wanted to show something else that exemplifies the uh, agrarian brutality of the regime, which is a palm tree, which was pointed out to me by the very good audio guide at the site that um, Khmer Rouge uh, used the sharp edged fronds of this palm tree to slit their um, victims' throats. And so this really brings together the, uh, both the agrarian nature of the regime and the industrialized uh, ways of killing. I will conclude with the same image that I started, which is um, the broadcast, the Beishan Broadcasting Wall in Kinmen. The nationalist government used the broadcasting wall to hurl propaganda from Kinmen across the narrow straits to Xiamen in mainland China, and it is a very literal, literal embodiment of Cold War narratives. But um, this picture, which is taken from Google Street View, um, allows me to form what I call the Google Maps allegory. And you can now visit almost any place in the world, including museums and places of memory, but your view will be distorted and your perspective will be limited by um, where you can go and what you can see. This, these considerations leave me with four broad conclusions that draw on my experience visiting the four sites I discussed. First, memory is messy and subjective. Um, the first industry of memory is the mind, but the mind makes deliberate or accidental mistakes. However, this doesn't mean that there are unlimited truths and that there aren't versions of history that are more accurate than others. Second, we use different tools to mediate history and memory. I visited these sites and then remembered them through my pictures, diary, um, revisiting them through Google Maps, and the internet, and more. So memory is also a composite of all these different sources that we have access to nowadays. Third, museums and memorials are fraught. They take a uh, stance that can evolve over time, and we can discuss what stances are more or less accurate, and especially what stances are more or less considerate of history's human subjects. Fourth, memory is both personal and universal. There is a shared humanity in the way that many people choose to approach personal and common histories, even though their own individual histories will differ between them. Um, in this uh, discussion, I you know, talk about my experience seeking history and memory in, in the sites that I visited um, in the reflection process of, of writing and preparing this presentation. And um, ultimately, the, the lesson that I draw from it personally and that I, I look forward to discussing more with the panel is that we are all perpetual uh, students or artisans laboring in our very own memory industrial complexes. Thank you, and I look forward to the questions and discussion. Helps us to, to, to really understand how we often get to know about uh, the events of the Cold War largely through the, the gaze of the tourists, right, which is shaped in many, many different ways and, and, and uh, uh, creates such uh, complication and complexity in the way we understand things. I'm sure there's plenty to talk about uh, uh, later. Uh, let, let, let's move on uh, to, to Marina. Uh, would you like to, uh, to start? Yes, um, I will also share my screen in just a moment. My computer is stuck, I apologize. 
<laughs> okay, maybe I can, while my computer is thinking about this, let me uh, give you some preliminary thoughts on this. Um, but this looks scary. I might not be able to show you my slides. Um, we, we can see your slides. Uh, they, are, they are on our screen now. Yeah, but my but your computer, uh, stuck, computer is, is frozen. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Give Marinas it some are having a, a hard time with. Uh, oh, there you go. Oh, ah, no. okay, good, good, good. Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me try again. Okay, you can see now, right? Perfect, perfect. Yes. Thank very you. Clear. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to share some preliminary thoughts on the ways the Cold War and the space race in particular might inform our thinking about the current geopolitical conundrum particularly the urgency of addressing climate change in a world ripe with geopolitical tensions. Why this inquiry? While uh, it often fueled Cold War rivalry and paranoia, the space race is typically understood as yielding considerable benefits for uh, human society. As the standard narrative goes, uh, and I here quote one of the many popular primers on the subject, Space exploration required and produced rapid improvements and advances in many fields, including telecommunications, microtechnology, computer science, and solar power. Today, hundreds of artificial satellites orbit the Earth and provide us with international communication systems, television, global positioning systems, and weather data. Space research has also greatly enhanced our theoretical and practical understanding of astronomy, meteorology, physics, and the various earth sciences. So can then a space race type competition deliver on the tech demands of our world today, especially demands related to climate change? Let me state from the get-go that this question is not asked lightly and should not be understood as an apology or endorsement of the Cold War. If I may borrow Kenneth opening statement to this conference yesterday, this indeed is an attempt to wrestle with the Cold War ghosts. As Kenneth suggested, perhaps the reason for the Cold War ghosts repeated invocation is that we have been unable or even unwilling to move beyond the Cold War imaginary. And as the cartoon caption goes, we can always use another space race. And so before I put the old ghosts to rest, uh, to rest, I want to resurrect them to see whether the space race competition, along with the promise of tech innovation and breakthroughs, can hold lessons for our turbulent times. The questions I want to understand are, are there lessons from the space race that can be meaningful today? Can the space race be instructive at a time of growing tensions an urgent need for technological breakthroughs on climate change. What are the space race dynamics uh, of competition and collaboration? And what are the space uh, race drivers and how can they inform today's dynamics? I will argue that the space race drivers cannot be a model for climate race today, even if addressing climate change requires certain degree of competition. This is because the technological breakthroughs and scientific advancement were primarily tools into ideological toolbox and not something that was inspired by urgent environmental and social needs at the time. Uh, and this is a particularly poignant question in the world today. At the same time, the competition did not only not erase ideological differences, but also diverted resources from desperately needed social programs. In my very limited time today, I will click quickly recap some key moments of the space race, and then we'll, with the help of visual representations, I will show how science and technology served as tools in two very distinct ideological toolboxes. I will then wrap up by summarizing key aspects of the space race and how they stack up against the world of competition and collaboration today. The space race can be dated to the unexpected launch of a Soviet satellite in space in 1957. This was something the US administration did not expect at all. And 
shortly after, in 1961, the Soviets also launched the first man in orbit, Yuri Gagarin. Shortly after, President Kennedy announced that the US will put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. His famous statement, we choose to go to the moon and to do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. I will let you interpret the statement on your own. Both countries ramped up resources leading to series of launches on both sides. I will spare you the timeline of the launches initiated by the two sides. We all know the outcome uh, of the so-called race. The first moon landing happened in 1961. And the photo here is of one of the three American astronauts who uh, planted the American flag on the moon. So how did ideology shape the race and the use of technology? And why do I argue that the tech race was lost in ideology? To examine this question, let me share with you how a common sense understanding of the race emerged in the two countries. The race, as I mentioned, started as an outcry and ridicule of the US complacency and complete lack of awareness of the Soviet progress. The US felt that losing a technological battle would have perverse effect on the US geopolitical standing and especially its ability to influence allies. Moreover, in the eyes of many, it would appear as if tyrannies are triumphing over democracies. A sense of ideological triumph, triumph was, of course, clearly visible in the Soviet posters. Note, for example, how similar are the poster of the cosmonaut in the middle uh, and the worker breaking the shackles of capitalist oppression. Both are featuring uh, a big globe in the background or one that the worker is standing on. But Oops. But there was more to the Soviet side of imaginaries. Within the Soviet Union, space exploration was in fact imbued with the imaginary aspiration of utopian space travels, which dated from the 19th century. In this way, the socialist ideology aligned itself perfectly with the vision of peaceful exploration of the universe and the ultimate ability of man to control nature and its men as male men. Uh, in the meantime, in the United States, the imaginary lacked uh, utopian undertones, grounding the justification for competition in a purely ideological um, democracy versus tyranny race, or blue versus red, um, as you can see in one of the cartoons. In other words, while the Soviet Union uh, instilled space exploration with a sense of futuristic utopia and not targeting the Americans specifically because they were already surpassed. The Americans were still looking to catch up and win a race. In other words, it would also almost appear as if the two countries were running different races. The Soviets, uh, and you can see the, uh, the Soviet poster from, from a magazine, um, did not get a, the message that they're racing towards the moon. They were conquering the universe. The two um, space creatures that you see on the poster are holding tickets. Uh, one says Earth to Jupiter and the other says Earth to Neptune. Um, in the US imaginary, on the contrary, the only justification for the engagement was to capture the moon and to achieve superiority over the Soviets. This in and of itself could not be sustained without significant opposition on the ground. And uh, you can see a um, series of images that appeared in uh, US media, uh, criticizing the spending on a space race when the earth is still overly polluted or the lack of understanding of human rights and, and human needs uh, on earth and rather than that spending all the money for uh, some moon race. Um, there was also an invocation of Vietnam and you can see here 
on the moon, the, the little um, rocket circling the moon, whereas uh, there are so many deaths in Vietnam. It seems then um, that the dedication of science and technology as part of the space race was, as I said, lost in ideology. From the US side, a race against communism, from the Soviet side, a race to be the first to conquer the universe. For the United States, there was a clear goal, uh, conquest of the moon, but this was not done for the benefit of people, but rather for political gain. Scientific break, breakthroughs therefore were to serve an ideological war in the competition, although it allowed for clear goal setting, uh, had many critics um, because of the exorbitant costs that remained uh, unjustified, making it a competition for competition's sake. At the same time, um, it could be also said, however, that the competition established the two space programs, the US and the Soviet one, uh, on equal footing and allowed for further collaborations, such as the launch of joint docking platform and joint flights in the following decades. So another um, or other characteristics of the competition um, because of the ideology and focus on attracting allies, the urgency of um, needs and social welfare protection were entirely lost. Um, technology and science were not channeled for the purposes of social justice, rights, and equality. The military impetus remained the strongest reason and driving force for the space race. And the neutrality of cosmos or, or space, which was pushed forth by uh, the UN, did not last very long. Um, and we know that from the Star Wars uh, initiated by the Reagan administration uh, in the 1980s. So what does this mean then in the current context and the urgent need for technological solutions to climate change? Can competition, um, a similar competition between the superpowers lead uh, to technological uh, innovation? Climate is certainly not reaching to the moon. Um, but there are a number of other similarities. For example, climate change is absolutely perceived as a security issue, and there could be significant military impetus in potential tech competition on climate. So is the question of geopolitics. China is already the leader in renewable technologies, and that has significantly expanded its influence across many countries because renewables is also a question of access and new supply chains to raw materials such as lithium. Just as with the space race, the cost of tech and scientific breakthroughs is exorbitant. But if the 1960s have taught us anything, it is that the cost is ultimately not an impediment when other interests are aligned. The question of ideology, however, has not disappeared um, and there are two observations worth mentioning. First is Xi Jinping's repeated statements that the world should not return to the Cold War mentality. He actually said that again yesterday. However, this does not mean that uh, there should be a non-ideological world. And the second is that if the space race uh, uh, prompts us to ask any questions, it is whether or not competition and collaboration can ever be ideology free. Finally, if the space race, race teaches us anything, it is that technology is seldom deployed for the purposes of social justice and equity, at least not up until this point. Thank you very much. The rich presentation, I mean, so many, so many questions, the possibility of Cold War uh, competition or competitiveness uh, uh, being harnessed for a similar, uh, for good uh, in, in terms of the climate race. What an, what an incredible question to pose. Uh, thank you so much for that.
uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty to talk about. Again, as always, time is not on our side. Uh, I want to uh, do one unexpected thing, which is uh, one of the speakers from the from part one uh, of this uh, theme today, who was, uh, oh no, okay, no, okay. We won't have to do that, good, we have more time now. So, uh, 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 gosh, let's, because we have a couple of questions that have come through to us, let's go to those. Uh, and there are very specific questions uh, directed at uh, Giacomo, um, three of them. So the first questioner has two questions and uh, she says, um, could you say a bit more on your subject? Let me read this carefully. Could you say a bit more on your subject position as tourist traveler and researcher of these sites? Are those two similar or different? That's her first question. And the second question is, a more general question, uh, while in your research, uh, did you encounter disparities between oral history narratives by people you talked to and what was memorialized? So that's uh, two questions. And then a third question, um, how would you compare your experiences of the Cold War as mediated through these museums to your experiences of the Cold War through Western institutions, for example, uh, what stood out as similar or, or, or different. So Giacomo, do you want to take those questions? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I can take in, in the order that you mentioned them. And thank you for sharing those questions. So on the subject of the position of tourist versus researcher, um, I think there is a difference insofar there is the, the image of a tourist as somebody who you know maybe responds more viscerally versus a researcher who is supposed to take a more you know cold-blooded quote-unquote objective stance and and i think in in my personal experience visiting these sites they certainly evoke a lot of feelings um you know both in from the perspective of human loss but also from the perspective of you know, human recovery and being able to um, reestablish a, a life and, and not letting past tragedy or, or suffering define you in, in perpetuity. So there's both, you know, something that saddens and that um, is inspiring. And, and, and that's something that, that I felt while being in those places. Whereas if I, I looked at them more, more coldly and, and analytically, um, you know, I might get lost in the detail of, you know, this, this, you know, specific plaque or the specific historical narrative is, is inaccurate, or I think it mis misrepresents the history. And so, you know, I, I really think that when visiting these sites, one should not close themselves off to, to responding in a more personal way and to thinking about how does my own past experience influence how I read these sites? Um, you know, how does my, I'm Italian, so how does my experience of, you know, people who, who, you know, were involved in, in, in World War II um, as and my family members were, were partisans, were soldiers in the Italian army, um, they were civilians, so the whole perspective, um, how does that, the stories that I heard from them influence how I, I read these museums? So th there's a lot of more personal in, in the tourist element. And the second question on the disparity between the oral history and what was memorialized, um, I would say, you know, one one element. There's the, the the scholarly perspective. There's the tourist perspective, and then there's something that you might call the journalistic perspective, where you you go and you interview a lot of people or talk to a lot of people to learn about their experience. And unfortunately, both because of language barriers and time, and because I'm you know personally not the kind of person who is who goes and approaches people and tries to talk to them and, and learn about them, and go in their face. I, I didn't speak to as many um, people from, from these countries as in the sites as I would have liked. And, and looking back, I really regret not having more of, of that personal nuance. And so the, the one example that I will give, however, is with Bomeng in, in Cambodia. And this is less something he, he communicated to me directly, but that I read about in his, his biography that he doesn't seek vengeance against the people who um, imprisoned him, tortured him, and killed his wife, but he seeks, um, you know, peace and the ability for them to admit to their wrongdoing, recognize their guilt, and allow, you know, 
him and, and other survivors and, and many sur Cambodians of their, his generation are survivors to, to live with the fact of, of what happened all those years ago. And you contrast that with you know, the, the official view from um, you know, Cambodia's prime minister, Hun Sen, who was a Khmer Rouge, then joined the uh, Vietnamese forces that invaded Cambodia, um, became a prime minister and is now, I think, the world's longest serving prime minister. He's been in power since the 90s. And um, that, that shape shifting doesn't really speak to any of the reflection and acknowledging you know, guilt or mistakes and trying to come to terms with the past. And so I think those two distinctions are, are, are something that stands out in my mind. And then um, finally, on the question of um, Western institutions, I have to say that, um, you know, I, I actually have not, um, unfortunately, experienced that many Western institutions about the Cold War. For example, I've never been able to visit Berlin or Poland or a lot of the um, you know, so-called Eastern Bloc countries or other non-aligned countries. And so my experiences with, with these museums in East and Southeast Asia um, with very American memorials in Washington, DC and in other American cities where, where I now live in the US, obviously. And um, I think those tell a very specific and very military story of the Cold War, both for the Vietnam War and the Korean War, um, just focused on the American soldiers who, who served in those places and completely you know, overlooked the fact that those soldiers went to places where people lived, where people were fighting for, for their own lives and their own interests and not necessarily American interests. And so um, I think insofar as I'm giving this sort of off-the-cuff response about American memorials of the Cold War, it is an extremely narrow perspective as somebody who comes in from outside, as um, um, Marina Gerzinitz uh, mentioned in, in the initial speech, it has to do with um, you know, the colonialist view as opposed to Southeast Asian countries talking more from the um, decolonizing view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a very general question, which I think is a really good question, which I want to maybe sort of end with. But before we before we get to that question, maybe I'll ask some specific uh, a specific question to the two marinas. Um, so, Marina Gruzinic, um, if you uh, I you know you've, you've given a, a very very uh, uh, high level uh, account of many many different things and how they connect, right? And central to this explanation, at least. Uh, from 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 what I'm hearing is uh, white supremacy, racism, and so on. And I'm I'm wondering uh, a word that you did not use in this in this in this uh, account is is populism. Uh, and I, I I wonder if you know because we talk about populism a lot these days and often in the context of a right wing sort of authoritarian form of populism. And is this a concept that's uh, um, important to you, legible in some ways? If we use your framework for making sense of um, this Cold War history and how it impacts on us uh, today. So that's the question for you. Uh, the question for Marina Canetti is, um, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking that uh, we, we're also seeing in, the, in, the current, in these current times uh, how uh, investments into such things as space exploration and all that uh, doesn't anymore involve purely state money, but very often private money, right? And it's, uh, uh, I mean, some people describe this as the, the vanity projects of uh, billionaires and so on and so forth. Uh, does this also help to help us to think about how we could harness uh, the Cold War style competitiveness uh, for thinking about climate change uh, kinds of investments or does it, kind of uh, com complicated and helpfully. So that's the question uh, for you. So maybe we come back to uh, Marina Kutinic. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, I mean, it's uh, key in a certain way. Uh, populism is certainly very important, but in my um, research, uh, it's uh, uh, to also think, uh, as I said, hashtag Black Lives Matter. 
how we come to this point, how we come to the point to invoke decolonization after 50 years uh, that decolonization is actually supposedly ending ended. But we know that in, especially in the Asian context uh, and also African context, is always said that decolonization actually never came to the end. This is the biggest problem of the whole um, rhetorics or talks or narratives. Um, so the, uh, for me, uh, the point also of, of uh, populism is really connected with uh, um, white supremacy, because when we understand populism, it's not about the people, like people that is uh, uh, emphasizing a certain loose of narratives, a mess of uh, contradictory ideology, but uh, populism in this uh, horrible uh, extension of uh, uh, it's actually rising with Trump. So we have uh, the Trump, what is Trump? It's a pure power uh, in terms of uh, uh, really a regime of whiteness, uh, this uh, white supremacy uh, that is uh, blatant and then uh, it's uh, a violent, uh, uh, so to say, like they call this a truthful, straightforward way of think, working or speaking. But if we see this Trumpism as a new format, not anymore the Balkanism uh, that we had from ex-Yugoslavia, practically realized directly in former Eastern Europe that was actually communist or socialist countries in the past. In, in Slovenia, from where I am coming, I'm, uh, this is my country, this uh, uh, after the um, former uh, Yugoslavia, we have a, a prime minister uh, with the name Janez Janša that means nothing to anybody, but it's actually a pure fascist a new form of fascism that it's there and nobody care, not even the European Union. So I think that uh, my point is to go back to uh, that key elements. And I said, white supremacy, what is racialization, subordina subordination, making the Occident actually as uh, civiliza civilizing superiority, but we see historically Definitely, uh, from colonialism, and then you have the genocide, you have Holocaust in the middle of Europe, and you actually realize that this is coming out from what? From what was going on by the colonizing uh, uh, situation in Africa, and then you have the question of citizenship. What is today Europe? Uh, see what's going on in Poland. Uh, uh, in Belarus and all what in Poland is doing like to protect the nation state. But how is this protection? You have thousands of people left in the limbo between uh, the borders of Belarus and Poland. Thousands, children completely dying. We are looking this and they are talking about security. So in this way, I uh, think we, it's necessary to turn back despite populism to turn back to the power because decolonization it's directly connected with the cold war you cannot think the cold war without the decolonization you can because you want actually to transpose the topic like uh, pal singh is saying uh, many many years in the past uh, uh, writing for uh, social text uh, in us he's saying why or suddenly after the second world war we have totalitarianism and democracy as the main discourse because the West doesn't want to discuss what actually did uh, the genocide inside Europe while exporting before the genocides all over out of Europe. They don't want to think and talk about uh, the Holocaust. And then you have all these uh, narratives that is too much nationalism and so on. But what is actually the Occident? Uh, uh, the 19th century and the uh, forming of the nation state. And today you have the worst kind of nationalism, including in China, everywhere else, because the Uyghurs, we cannot just uh, uh, behave like this is not our uh, problem, or we cannot uh, think or think what's going on with Hong Kong. And also, as I said, what's going on with former Eastern Europe, that the UAE, um, Uni United Europe, or what is called European Union, they just leave the things. They just control, for example, with Poland, that the uh, law is functioning because they want security for trade. Similar what's happened to Hong Kong and the British relation. They wanted the British law in Hong Kong, but they didn't care afterwards what will be the human rights because mm. they wanted to have the trade impeccable. Mm. The, the, the goods has to go around, but the people doesn't matter. Sorry, I, I was a little bit maybe too long.
No, no, it's fine. Uh, in fact, I, I would like to um, uh, wedge in a question that came that's come in to us from the audience, which I, which you know, kind of, I suppose it's a constructive, uh, uh, um, uh, it's a constructive question, right? Which is, uh, can you elaborate a bit more on how, looking back at the decolonization movements following the post-independence period, allow us to interrogate new possibilities of interrogating citizenship um, structure and its relationship to justice and rights, as opposed to the nationalist demands in this uh, current moment. So, so, so what is to be done? So, so, well, well, now I think uh, uh, it's uh, what is to be done. It will be actually necessary to understand uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, from my point of view, all these uh, um, horrible millions of people of, from refugees uh, uh, to uh, um, minorities in nation states without rights, completely put uh, at the verge, nobody can anymore, uh, 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 will, will, will be necessary to rethink. Uh, the whole uh, strategy of the global world, but this is, I think, uh, we, we are at the point that this is absolutely out uh, of uh, the debate, and uh, in a certain way, paradoxically to say, we are uh, monstrous in just uh, uh, um, uh, analyzing and watching, but absolutely not doing uh, anything and i think it's connected not because of certain humanity blah blah narratives but it's connected with actually the phase of neoliberal capitalism that has a history because capitalism really has a history and this history it's more than just financial capital it's what uh, one of uh, maybe decolonial uh, theorist or post-colonial ashile membe is saying very clearly, we live in necrocapitalism. Necrocapitalism means that you have already uh, uh, a, di uh, a disposal of millions of people who will never work and actually who uh, their uh, death uh, really killing. It's uh, bringing more profit than uh, uh, ever, uh, nothing else. So it's not about labor. The, the, um, Killing of them and disposal of millions of people is actually the new form of profit for uh, financial capitalism as another form. So I'm very uh, pessimistic, but my point is to have very clearly these two points together. Black Lives Matter, the hashtag, why? It's about supremacy and this supremacy is not just racism. It's a whole process of the model of uh, regime, how uh, uh, power is, the new power is actually pushed. And I said, populism, wonderful question, can be connected to Trump. How, what was going on? And then, as I said, um, uh, the, um, in limbo communities, they are there, but we don't care anymore. Okay. And the paradox is this, yeah, new nation state, citizenship, freedom, but what we have, we have the repetition, yeah. uh, the trauma. Okay, so 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 from 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 one pessimistic Marina, uh, which uh, who talks about our zombie human condition, <laughs> kind of a necro uh, capitalist uh, capitalist necro neoliberal condition, to a more optimistic Marina, perhaps. <laughs> what do you what do you say about the um, resonance between the space race and the um, climate race? Yeah, uh, thank you, Kenneth. Um, I think it's a very good question. I was thinking of including something on the new type of space race and sort of the the role of private money into the space race. Um, if you have been watching this uh, space, so to speak, after Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos went into the cosmos, even the Queen of England said that the money needs to be used uh, for uh, helping climate change rather than for uh, kind of voyeuristic journeys into space. Uh, and, and what is interesting here is that it's very easy um, to say, oh, this is the main difference between the Cold War uh, style competition and what's happening now, because now it's all private money, they're coming in, they're um, sort of creating a new version of a, of a space competition between themselves. But is it really private money? Jeff Bezos, when he came down from his first flight, thanked his workers who are paid minimum wage 
um, and enabled his flight. Mm -hmm. So this is all um, in in a way it links uh, to what Marina was discussing about neoliberal capital and the collusion, if you will, between governments and corporations that allow corpora uh, corporations to have exorbitant profits and then to do whatever they want with, with those profits, right? Rather than uh, channeling them towards social programs, whether these are related to climate change or not. Um, and so, yes, there's definitely something cooking in the uh, cosmos, so to speak, that will not in any way um, support the Maldives or Tuvalu or any other nation that is dealing with uh, the fast uh, consequences of, of climate change now. Um, and so the question is, do we need a Sputnik, so to speak, moment? that might ignite um, kind of concerted effort of using science and technology for the purposes of climate change today. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. Now we've got only seven minutes left and we've got two terrific questions that I would like to just read out and then maybe get your one or two minute response to uh, as a way of closing. So the very f uh, the first question is a specific one for, for, for you again, Marina uh, Can Canetti, uh, which is uh, from Vinit and he asks about the degrowth strategies, whether uh, they can possibly be a beyond techno solutionist view that could enter into climate change cold war race in a new uh, con configuration. Okay, so that's that's the question specific to you. And then a question from Cherry and George, uh, a general question, which I think is a very provocative one that all of you can respond to in some ways. And he asks, uh, my question concerns the messiness of actual cold war history, a theme that has been running through in this conference uh, and re-emphasized in this panel. Clearly, rival states have an interest in sweeping away this messiness and promoting simpler binary and zero sum frames. But is the impatience with mess, but is the impatience, no, does the impatience with messiness have deeper psychological roots? Are humans more comfortable with simpler narratives of good versus evil? And state actors merely responding, are, are state actors merely responding and then reinforcing this very natural human tendency for, for binaries, particularly black and white, good and evil, and so on. So uh, perhaps one or two minutes each, uh, and let's maybe move uh, uh, backwards. So beginning with uh, Marina Canetti. Okay, um, so on the question of degrowth, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question, and one that I have not thought about from, from this perspective, but... Um, Realistically speaking, um, I, I don't see anybody pushing for degrowth from, uh, from the COP26 discussions. And, and so, although there might be possibilities there, um, I, I think by the time we get to that space, it might be a little too late for, for some people. Um, on the question of messiness and impatience with messiness and, and the good versus evil narratives, completely agree on this. I, I think there is a, a human tendency to look at a world as um, black and white and, and to sort of ascribe categories to people and to things. And one of the um, most striking um, aspects of the space race when I was uh, researching this question was actually that right after the space race that everybody knows about, there was space collaboration. Um, but because it's not a convenient narrative that the communists and the capitalists can work together and put together um, a docking space where they can land their ships, that was very quickly buried uh, into back to the old ideological competition. And so um, this is also why I kind of finished my presentation with the question, can we actually live in a world without ideology? Because I think a lot of times um, this black and white 
distinctions require ideological commitments that are quite extreme. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. How about you, Giacomo? What do you think? Yeah, I think I think it's a great question, and, and I would agree with Marina that um, I think there there is a natural human tendency to see things in black and white, or at least those are the stories that we probably find most compelling and most digestible. And related to your earlier question about populism, it is one that politicians are, are very quick to seize upon. Um, I think that you know, real stories and, and engaging with memory and history in a real way is difficult and painful and requires acknowledging, for example, that people can be both victims and perpetrators at the same time. Um, and it, that neither of those identities that are simultaneous necessarily detracts from, from the other. And so um, I, I don't necessarily have a recipe to enabling people or, or cultural society to, to move away from this dichotomy and stop to pause and, and reflect more on, on what is our history or, or you know, what is our shared identity. But um, I would say that probably this boils down and this you know, would be a whole other panel on what is politically expedient versus what delivers you know, justice. And I think what delivers justice is very hard work and um, building connections with people that might be different and, and might have done bad things to you. Um, but without that, you know, you can't really have progress and, and reflection and a more real accounting of the past. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. And finally, uh, Marina? Yes, very shortly, I think humanity yeah. should be a scene in between uh, that is important question, this last part, are state actors merely responding and then reinforcing this human tendency? Humanity in between the dehumanization processes that we see and the post-human mm. that is actually uh, put as a kind of a future. So the humanity as such is an ideological category. I um, uh, agree with my both uh, preceder uh, that, that were speaking and exposing, but it's not only this, it's a really a question of our uh, relations and uh, this good and evil, good and evil, evil, it's because we are too much in these Hollywood films. We think we will solve the things with Rambo, uh, but unfortunately, um, uh, the question will be not solved in such a way. Thank you. That's terrific and a wonderful way to end. Uh, let me thank you all for really compelling presentations and um, thought provoking and very passionately uh, delivered as well. So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to hear you and to, uh, interact with you in this way. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's been uh, sending in questions. Uh, uh, we, we will come to an end now and resume in 15 uh, minutes time when we will have uh, the third of our keynote uh, lectures. Uh, this one jointly presented by He Pao Kang and uh, John Keane and very ably uh, uh, chaired by uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Carson. Uh, so join us again in 15 minutes and let's have a round of applause for excellent uh, presenters today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank and you for you, time. Kenneth. Thank and you. For your Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Let's stay in touch. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.